Warning, the content you're about to receive is for the sole purpose of exposing fake trainers, doctors, nutritionists, life coaches, and wellness gurus, in addition to educate them and provide you with accurate information. You know, I've been in the uh, health and fitness and personal training business for 36 years, and I'm more pissed off now than I've ever been in my life. And for the simple reason that there are so many, so many fake trainers, health gurus on the market that it's it's gotten to the point where it's pathetic. And you know, in my industry, gym accidents are on the rise, and it has everything to do with people that are out there in the industry that aren't real. And it, it's, it, goes, it's, it cuts across all kinds of walks of life and professions. Now, as a trainer, one of the things I had to learn how to do was to manipulate the components that were responsible for changing the body in the most efficient way. There's three, four components. You got uh, weight training, cardio, nutrition, cardio training, nutrition, and the mental aspect. Those are all components that the people that are legit in the market whether they're a trainer, whether they're an athlete, that they, to some degree, learn how to manipulate that because what that does is that creates efficiency uh, in your training, which is especially important when you want to perform at the highest level. And it, it cuts down on injuries, and it's a way for you to be able to reproduce a result. If you cannot do that in whatever kind of profession that you're in, you're not going to last very long. Now, we're going to interview somebody today that's amazing. She is a five-time, um, first of all, her name is Kathy. You go by Kat? I, I go by Kat, please. Kat. Oh, yes, Thank I'll you. call you Kat. Kat, now, uh, I, I want to make sure I get this right. Okay. Five-time world champion? World kickboxing champion. Kickboxing champion. Is that Correct. like, uh, uh, M, uh, not MMA, does that W, what is that? Tell me, because I've, I've lost, obviously. <laughs> All right. If you're, if, if those who are familiar with Muay Thai in, from Thailand, um, you take the punching and the kicking inside and outside the legs and the body and the face. Uh, you're just not allowed to elbow and knee at that time. But in full, full rules Muay Thai, you can clinch them and elbow them in the face and knee them in the face and the body. Yeah. Um, I just didn't go to quite that level. I learned it, but I didn't fight at that level. Yeah. Uh, the thing I'm curious about is, um, <clears throat> so in your sport, because I, again, as someone who's trained people, I've trained like at a, um, uh, what are they, the, F the FC, those fighters, what are they called? The UFC? UFC. I've trained some fighters like that. In those that. gyms? Yeah, is but, that what you're saying? Yeah, but... Okay, but I've UFC, UFC is an organization. No, I've, tra I've trained somebody who's gone to fight in a UFC fight, I okay, guess what Okay, so what you're training them in is conditioning for MMA. Okay, so okay. my question to you is, uh, I was trying to get the question out, is <laughs> do you train uh, with, do you do weight training for your sport? I did some amount of weight training for my sport. I, when I first started kickboxing, I started as a bantamweight, which is 118 pounds up to basically 114 to 118. And uh, that was the cap for, yeah. the, for that organization or whatever organization I fought under. I wanted to go up in weight class, so I power lifted for about three months Interesting. to gain four or five pounds. It took a while. Interesting. Because my cardio was so, so much. Yeah. That it took a while to build muscle. Yeah, because yeah, because what you were doing at that at that point, you were actually uh, burning lean tissue because of all the cardio that you're yes, doing. Yes, I was. You know, the the big misconception, which I, I think is a good point, is when it comes to cardio conditioning, people think, well, if this is good, then more must be better. And like we we had that mindset in bodybuilding because we're always, always trying to strip body body fat to get really that lean look, so the muscles would pop. But it actually had an opposite effect because. Right. At, at some point, it's usually about after 25 minutes of cardio, then your body starts actually burning uh, too much lean tissue, so you don't necessarily get in better shape. And I think that's kind of what you're saying. Uh, well, it's not that I got. It's not that you don't get in better shape. It's just that it's difficult to gain the weight that you need to gain if you want to fight, because it, it's really easy to 
eat crap for a few months and gain some weight, but yeah. that doesn't help you. Right. It doesn't help you at all. Yeah. If you really want to gain that lean muscle, then powerlifting and, and uh, supplementing was was vital. Otherwise, it wasn't going to happen. And here's the interesting. This is really this is a really good debate because I can tell you this from a, because the ongoing debate in in the sport that I was in was which is the best way to put on muscle: lifting heavy or lifting more weight, uh, lifting doing more reps. And most people would say lifting heavy puts on muscle better than doing more reps. In other words, volume training. It's actually not the case. Volume training actually puts on more muscle. Now, your power uh, lifting that you were doing, specifically, that doesn't mean that you don't put on muscle, but when you power lift, you're specifically training for strength, and the side effect is muscle. When you're, vol when you're volume training, the specific uh, response that happens is your body puts on more muscle, and the secondary uh, effect is strength. So it's... What you're saying is not inaccurate, but if you wanted to uh, put on four pounds uh, in the most efficient way, right. I would have had you on a bodybuilding, uh, a modified volume training schedule so you wouldn't get too bulky. Well, Leo, let me tell you this. <laughs> we knew nothing. We jumped, went into a gym and I wanted to gain the weight and we worked with a power lifter. Now, I'll tell you, throughout my entire professional career, I was always at weight, 365 days a year at weight, always. I never varied, never. But at the same time, I was working two jobs, teaching full-time, training full-time, and I got to eat maybe once a day, maybe. If I was wow. lucky, I ate once a day. I maintained a 5% body fat. But it wasn't, Which is incredible for a I female. I didn't do it on, person, in, you know, on purpose. Yeah. I just, that's the way it worked out. I was deprived of sleep, overloaded with responsibilities, and you know, had training. I trained harder than anybody I ever met at yeah. that time. No guys were doing the kind of training I had to do. Yeah. I had a Marine as a coach, so <laughs> you yeah. know how to thrash you well. Yeah. Um, and, and the thing about it is this. Look, it, it, your body is so fantastic. Your physiology is so amazing and fantastic that it's going to adapt to it, to that environment. You're right. It has to. Or it's either if, if you overtrain, which is always something that we were um, concerned about, when you overtrain, then your body has a way of, of shutting you down. It'll start, uh, all of a sudden you'll start getting injuries. Yep. You know, it has its own ways to try to protect you. Sometimes we override that, especially for, like, in my case. Yep. I'm very upfront about that. I got to a level where I was taking steroids. And that mass, that, that buffers the natural responses that your body gives. And that's how you end up getting sometimes severely hurt. Right. But your body, and you're a great proof of that, it's going to adapt to its environment. It did it despite the, yeah. no sleep. Yeah. You know, and, all that, and being trained by somebody who really wasn't training you specifically for your sport. No, he wasn't. You and know? when I got into kickboxing, I, I was already a black belt in Kung Fu Sun Tzu and a black belt in Aikido. And I got challenged by some girl to compete against her in kickboxing. I'd never done it. She'd been doing it for two years. She weighed 190. I weighed 120. So I said, well, how long do I have to train? She goes, 10 days. Wow. I said, I'll take that challenge. <laughs> I took it. And you know what? I went to a boxing gym for 10 days and learned how to punch correctly and we beat the shit out of each other. <laughs> okay, let me rephrase that. I went to a boxing gym. <laughs> we trained, we, I trained in boxing and we beat the snot out of each other, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> depending on who's listening. Yeah. So, um, but I, was, I discovered at that time, just a, I was an adrenaline junkie that moment. The moment that happened, yeah. during that three rounds of, of having, being scared half out of my wits, I discovered just a love of being scared to death and having to perform anyway. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it you know? really is. And that can get you, I mean, that's your body's, you know, your body has a, an amazing survival uh, system built into it. That's right. <laughs> and, it's all you know, right here, my friend. And I, I, I can only <laughs> relate to you in a, in a certain way, because uh, what you're telling me it reminds me of something. When I was growing up and an athlete coming through uh, high school, I never had to, uh, any altercations with anybody. Nobody messed with me. I happened to be a pretty good athlete, and they just left me alone. And plus, I don't think I was an asshole that much. I mean, I probably was, <laughs> but I, nobody would, me would mess with me. You know, I, but I never looked for it. Right. You know, type thing. I never did either. I didn't. I had one, one altercation where I pushed somebody up against the wall and had my hand on his neck, and that was it. He was a senior that had something in for me. Well, anyway, so when I go to college, I'm out of college now, I thought, you know, I have to get this out of my system because I'll never really know. 
I don't know if I can fight. And I never had to, but I didn't know if I could. So you, what I did is I went and got a job as a bouncer at a nightclub because I thought, <laughs> this is how smart I am, quarterback. I thought, I bet I'm going to get in a fight sooner or later there. Sooner or later. Sooner or later. Sooner than later. Yeah, And you know something? I, I got the job. The first time I got this fight, I have no clue how that fight went because I was somewhere else. And I think this is kind of what you're talking about, that adrenaline, and I went somewhere else. And it was like instinct or my intuitiveness, my will to win and fight, yep. just something else kicked in, you know? It has to. It's, a, it's a called survival mode. Survival mode. Right. And that's, that's kind know, of what you went into. basically. It's, it's like, you know, I need to, I need to preserve myself in yeah. that respect. Self-preservation definitely kicks in when you're in a... I mean, it wasn't necessarily a life or death situation, but it could have turned that way. Yeah. Because there are no rules. There's no judge standing yeah. there saying, oh, well, you can't do that. They're not allowed to. Or you can't wear protective gear. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and I think yeah. your body is just has this, uh, this ability to, when it feels like it's being threatened, you know, even if you don't really realize that, it goes into that mode. Well, there are those who, you know, uh, crumble under the pressure of, of an altercation. I mean, even if they're in the gym training all the time, sparring with different people, as soon as they get into that fight, the, the competitive aspect of that, of that fight, they freeze. So let me ask you this, because yeah. this is a, kind of the, because uh, you're, you're, you're proving something maybe, but so how can you take that person if they have all the skill, natural skill, they can punch in there, but they don't, they don't have that. Can you teach that, like through through um, mental aspect? Is that just something that no, you sir. either have it or you don't? You have it or you don't. Is that right? Yeah. No there tricks. Has, no, the there tricks. has to be something inside. Yeah. It's either that flip of the switch that all of a sudden I'm tired of this sh shit and I'm just going to do something. Yeah. Or I'm tired of being beat on and You've that, had enough. that switch yeah. gets flicked on and then, then they go. But yeah. If they don't get, if they don't reach that point, no matter you, what, no matter yeah. what training, no matter what you say, no matter how much advice, doesn't matter. That's interesting. Yeah, it doesn't you know, matter. It goes to show you, you can do all these things right, you know, to be very specific to your your game. But if you don't have that, that's kind of the X factor right there. Think about it. Professional athletes, let's say in baseball, for example, and they know they're 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 in their, they've got the pressure of the game. Everybody's watching, yeah. and that's the key. There's people watching you, and I have to perform now. Yeah. So you either thrive under that, and you like the idea that people are watching, and that makes you perform better, or you freeze. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was, you know, being an athlete, I knew sometimes that, you know, if I had a bad game or something, you know, that, that was, you know, the only way. I couldn't sleep. After I had a bad football game, I could not, it was hard for me to sleep. All I could think about is I wanted to redeem myself. This was killing me, <laughs> you know? It will. I need a game like tomorrow to get to, to redeem myself to, so I know I can do this. I can do this. Did that happen to you? No. <laughs> oh, man. No, it didn't happen to me. And here's why. Because I didn't have to rely on anybody else to play well for that team to win. I didn't have to rely on my coach. It was me inside that ring. I was the only one I had to rely on, and that was it. And I, I enjoyed that. I preferred that. I was in all through high school. I played team sports, but you know, I may not have been as talented as some of the players, but I played my heart out. I did absolutely the best I could. And when I saw that Joe Schmo wasn't, yeah. I'd get mad. Yeah. But I guess what I'm saying is that even with that being said, I mean, how about you? I mean, there's something about shaking your confidence, okay? Like, let's just say that you went out and somebody just hammered you, you got your ass kicked all over the place. Yeah, I mean that's happened. Yeah, I mean I think I think again adversity again you know either defines it or destroys you. But how did you deal with that? I mean when you had like a bad when you got your ass whipped, you know how did you deal with that? You, what was that process that was going through your head? I mean were you talking a certain way, or I'm I'm really curious to know because you're answering some questions really interesting. I find I find that uh, in the way you're answering well, that different than most yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. tell tell me how you dealt with that. Well. Um, Two factors is, is twofold in that respect. Um, on a on a day to day basis, on a personal level, um, my trainer, who is also my boyfriend and also my kung fu instructor, was horribly abusive, physically, mentally, you name it, spiritually, horribly, horribly abusive, and I suffered more injuries from him than I did, basically, in sparring or mm -hmm. anything else. 
I was never willing to cross that line and hit him back. I was never willing to defend myself because how do you hurt somebody that you care about? Yeah. I mean, it didn't mean I didn't see the openings. It didn't mean I knew I couldn't stick my fingers knuckle deep in his eye or hit him in the windpipe or crush his testicles or stomp on his knee. I could have easily. But I also knew that harming him like that is dropping myself down to that level, mm -hmm. down to a really low level where, you know, the mentality is more like a monkey than it is a human being who, who is more evolved. Yeah. And I could not do that. So having said that, when I'm competing in a sport, and it's, remember, kickboxing is just a sport. They say it's a fight, but it's a competition with a set of rules, yeah. and you have to wear a set of protective gear, and you have judges deciding who's, who's the better fighter that day. It's a, it's a sport, period. Yeah. So in that, in that realm of the sport, um, you know, there was one time I went to England to fight under a specific set of rules. I trained in Manchester for nine days. I get there the day of the fight. It's in London at a big, huge theater, big, huge arena, I should say. Sorry, not theater. And as soon as I walk in, he goes, oh, we're changing the rules. It's going to be full, full Muay Thai, but no elbows. And I said... Really? Contractually, this is what I agreed to. Yeah. And contractually, this is the fight we're supposed to be having. He goes, well, you know, I tell you what, if you don't have to fight, but you're going to go home and I'm not going to pay you. And I went, okay, I'm staying yeah. and I'm going to fight. And I got, I got schooled. She didn't hurt me, but she just outclassed me and schooled me that night. And... In my mind, I thought, well, okay, I accepted the fight under these rules, and I got, I got outclassed and hammered. I didn't get hurt, but you know, I, I just thought, okay, I can accept that, because I accepted something under rules I didn't understand, and I tried it anyway, yeah. and it didn't work, and so be it. Yeah. You know, make that as a learning lesson and go on to the next fight and, and continue on. Yeah. But the defining moment was my coach slash boyfriend slash kung fu instructor screaming and yelling at me and humiliating me in front of 40,000 people in that, in that arena. Wow. And from that moment, I'm watching him and I'm looking behind him and I'm watching the, the people who are just aghast and, and flabbergasted by the fact that he's humiliating me. Mm -hmm. You could hear a pin drop. Nobody was said a word while he's screaming at the top of his lungs at me. And at that moment, I decided I'm never going to lose again. If that's what it means to lose, I'm never going to lose again. Yeah, the pain of that. It wasn't was... the pain. It was just the humiliation. Yeah. And I just thought, oh, no. <laughs> if this is what it's going to be to lose, I'm not losing. And from that point on, I never lost again. But it's just one of those things where mentally, it's all mental. No matter yeah. what goes on physically, it's all here. It starts there. All of it. Yeah. No, it doesn't start there. It is there. It is there, yeah. Yeah. The body will do what it's going to do. It's yeah. all here. Now, has it become something of second nature? Or do you have to, like, are there any techniques, mental techniques that you use? I mean, that one, it sounds like that one moment really just flipped the switch. It, it flipped the switch in that it was really early in my professional career. Um, so all the rest of the fights after that, in my mind, I thought I hadn't won a world title yet, but, you know, I was gunning for that world title. And then as soon as I got a world title, which was one of the hardest fights I've ever had to go through, I realized people are going to be gunning for that title. They can't have it. <laughs> you can't have this. Oh, no. It's mine. You can't have it, ever. Yeah. And I never, never lost in that respect. Yeah. Um, you know, but fighting for my first world title, I walked in with broken ribs. Two broken ribs. They were already broken. Yeah. And only a week of recovery, Yeah. which was and stupid. Is, <laughs> well, but this is the kind of thing I call it perfect willingness, you know, and a lot of people, most people don't have that. You know, they, they like the idea of being a world champion or somebody who competes at a high level, but they don't have the perfect willingness that it takes to endure like what you're talking about. Sure. That's a lot of crap that you're enduring to get to that point. Yeah. You know, it's... and it's frustrating. I mean, as, a, as somebody who trains clients, you know, um, I talk, I've done a, a uh, interview one time where a, um, a live feed where I said, you know, there's fake trainers out there, but there are also fake clients, and they're one and the same because you have a fake trainer here who's not willing to put in the extra time because it, it requires discipline and energy. In other words, even if you feel like hell and you've got two broken ribs, you go in and do it anyway. Right. You just go. Fuck that. It's just a broken rib. 
Well, not only that, this is a chance at a world title. Exactly. To be a world champion. I'm no, not you're not going to be stuck. No. <laughs> you know, yeah. but that's not, obviously, that's not the, uh, the you know, that's the very few that can do that. The percentage, small percentage of people that can do that, just like the same where, you know, then you have a fake client, I call them. And I say, you're the client that comes to me. Because I've, I've interviewed so many over the years, you know, the fact, fact, yeah, I want this and this and this, and they're all, hmm, they're hot and bothered about doing that. So, you know, two weeks in, or two months into their program, when the honeymoon wears off, where are they? And, and listen, some of that is on a trainer. I mean, we can do, we have things that we can do that I can do to keep you in that game longer, but ultimately you have to be there. You, you're the one that has to participate in that. You do, and you as, as a trainer and a, and a competitor in that sport especially, you have to be comfortable in, outside of your comfort zone. Yes, that's exactly right. You really do. You have to be comfortable there. You have to understand that you, know, you will survive it and you'll be okay, yeah. and everyone's there supporting your efforts. But you're outside of your comfort zone exactly. because it sucks. It, that's exactly right. <laughs> it really does I suck. I think that's really well said in the way you said that. You know, and yet, and yet again, you know, part of the, the reason I'm doing this interview with you is to really show that this is what real, uh, somebody who is real in the sport of, you know, what it looks like. And it's not just, oh, my God, you got there, you know, how, the, you made it look easy, and it must have been really an a easy, smooth path, uh, <laughs> you know, to this thing. No. They, they don't have, they have no clue. And it irritates the hell out of me, like with clients, because they're always bitching and moaning. And I said, you know, I, I have a, a low tolerance level uh, for, for people like that. It just, it just irritates the hell out of me, you know. But, but if you're not willing to make that commitment to yourself, you know, and uh, to keep focused like that, it's just, it won't happen for well, you. Let me ask you, how many times have you fired yourself from, from a client? Yeah. How many times have yeah. you done that? No, you know. I know I have. Yeah, I, I've told people, I said, look, this is not the place where you, you need to be because yeah. you're wasting your time and money. And right. I'm, you're you wasting know, your time and, and money my, as and well. Mine, and mine, both, right. yeah. And, I, and I've done that, you know. And i tell you something, I think, I think that's made me even a uh, higher sought out uh, person to come to because you know you got to stand for something or you fall for everything. I, right. I think that's a saying or something. <laughs> I, I've never heard the saying, but it, it's very it's, applicable. It, it's yes. kind of like that, you know. So uh, very fascinating. Um, you know, you're very impressive uh, in your. I like I like your energy, but but as far as like um, you know, did you ever? Because um, I here's what I know. In, in those three components that we talk about, I know that if you can manipulate those components to the nth degree and be very specific to your sport, whatever that is, that, you know, all things being equal, that'll help you perform uh, at the end of the day. My question is, because I, I don't know, did you ever do anything with, with nutrition, for example, to see if how you ate a certain way, if it actually, if the outcome, if you felt differently, if you felt better <laughs> endurance, I mean, there's that all bullshit. <laughs> Seriously, Leo, my, my nutrition was at the very end of the day, we'd go to Marie Callender's and I'd have a little piece of chicken a little bit of rice and some broccoli. And I was lucky if I got to go one day, one time, once in that day, and have a meal. I was lucky. So, Imagine what no, you nutrition done. did not play a force. Imagine <laughs> if I could have eaten regularly. Imagine if you could have done that. Imagine, but I didn't. Yeah. You know, I'm telling you. It, it can there's overrun. so many things that I had to do that required mental, mental fortitude and not, being, not getting massages ever not getting any kind of maintenance done because I know I tell my athletes, my fighters, for every two hours of training, you need an hour of maintenance. That means stretching, that means hot bath, that means Epsom salts or, or uh, magnesium, and you need massages. And if you don't get them, your body's going to rebel and you're going to fall apart. Yeah. And I tell them that. And then it doesn't matter. They st I'm also a professional massage therapist. So, you know, I d do all kinds of healing work in that respect. Yeah. But... I'd get fighters coming to me, coach, ooch, ouch, ooch, yeah. ouch, you know, and I'd work on them, and they hadn't seen me in three months. Yeah. On the table. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you don't get that, your body's going to fall apart. I never got it. Yeah. Never yeah. got it. Well, and the thing never. that we know, you know, and, and again, coming back to my sport, is that you're only as good as your recovery. Yeah. You know, and if you can start that recovery process immediately after you train. And that's why I'm saying, I mean, in spite of all that, look at the, the kind of success that you had. It was just, I mean, it's a testament to your, 
to your uh, to the strength that you have in your mind. But I mean, I'm telling you because this kind of <laughs> this is my area. Is that you know physiologically, I understand how how to make a body recover almost immediately. You know, there's a certain a certain way that you eat certain amino acids that you take that are fast acting uh, amino acids. God, I wish I had BCAs when I was. Biting. Oh, the, I didn't the, have any. Yeah, and, and there's <laughs> what the hell was a BCA? Yeah. I didn't know what the hell that was. Yeah, and there's stuff that you can do, and it's all it's all uh, uh, you know supplementation. There's no drugs involved. I mean, there's things that you can do with amino acids that can, uh, for example, arginine. I don't know if you heard. Of, of course, okay, I know what yeah, it is. Okay, arginine, <laughs> citrulline. Back then, I didn't know what any yeah, of it was. Yeah, but these are all things that you know vasodilate your body, so you can put push more. Uh, in, right. Yeah, I mean. That kind of stuff makes a huge difference, and even in spite of that, I mean, you. you uh, so, so now, now that you know some of this stuff, like in nutrition, how do you, how, how are you talking to your athletes about this kind of stuff? I mean, it sounds to me like you're saying, look, you need to get in here to recover. Okay, that's why. But what about? I'm still interested in, in. What are you saying to them as a coach then for nutrition? That's a good question. Um... I guess I'm solid on the basics of nutrition, but when it comes to, you know, diving in deep for a professional athlete or even an amateur athlete who is, you know, pushing their body all the time, I honestly don't have anything to refer to except one person who, um, the second school that I opened, he, uh, he's a, a, in my opinion, a world-renowned nutritionist. Um, and he, he'll do a full blood panel on you and tell you where you're deficit and where you're strong and what you need to, yeah. how you need to. But he's also a trainer. And I, you know, I never really got access to him except that um, every once in a while he'd offer a little bit of advice. And I'd look at him like, Jay, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, yeah. but I really don't. I mean, yeah. I have the basics, but when it comes to nutrition for fighters especially, um, I, I, you look at fighters now and they take that wrestling mentality where they walk around 30 pounds heavy and as strong as they can be and then they cut the weight and they cut it. And it, it's not, it's incredible. That yo-yo effect is going to have wreak well, havoc on their body when they're older. Yeah. And, and you, you hear all the time where somebody didn't make weight or somebody made weight and then they had to be rushed to the hospital yeah. because they cut way too much weight too soon. Yeah. And... Getting people away from that whole mentality, it's that rough. wrestling mentality, it's rough. it is rough because yeah. they're saying, yeah, but he's walking around at 160 pounds, he's got a medium to large bone structure, and what am I going to do? Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I don't thankfully, I didn't have to deal with that. But yeah, because I, I, you were really close to your weight all the time, you said. All the time. I was at weight. Yeah. I mean, at weight. Yeah. I didn't go under, I didn't go over, yeah. never. So, and the thing that was going on, besides, you know, uh, things that you're talking about with these wrestlers that are losing weight like that, when you lose weight that quickly, what happens is, is your body starts losing lean weight. Right. And you start sacrificing that lean weight. And, of course, you're going to go into this match where you need full, you know, a lot of strength. And you're, you've already put yourself at a disadvantage right. uh, because of that. I mean, and that's kind of the stuff that I'm talking about. You know, um, and, I, you know, I don't want to, you know, I have a, this app. I think, look, the, this, these components that I'm, I'm talking to you about, I think mm -hmm. would actually be very beneficial in, in, to your athletes, okay? Because, like, with, in my area, the trainers that are advising their clients, okay, and this is with regard to the three uh, training components. In this case, it's the weight training, cardio, and nutrition most of these trainers, even the fake ones, have a basic idea of, of weight training. It's basic, okay? Right. But they're usually not that good with cardio and nutrition as far as being able to tell their client uh, and setting up a coherent uh, training program that's built together to work right. together. Yes. So what I'm doing with them uh, is uh, with this, these training components is let's just say that you're a trainer that's really good on your weight training. I tell the trainers, look, you can ha you can use this this um, this app and just you can use your own training. I'm not trying to take over how you're training your client necessarily. Even though mm -hmm. I, I would bet my left one that you're probably training them half wrong because you don't know everything you should. Right. But I'm not going to interfere with you there. But on these other two components, this is where this app and somebody like me can really help. I, I think that can really help some of your athletes because. You, they just come on and they on this app they just have to weigh once a week and measure three sites. I control those other two components and I, I, I develop that incongruent with the way that you're training them in the weight room, let's just say. Sure. 
And because your physiology, well, I wouldn't train them in the weight room. No, but but I mean, you know, I would I would <laughs> right. I would be the nutrition side of it. Let's just yes. put it that way, Got okay? It. And I would I would make that nutrition fit their sport, if you will. And the way your body has this natural rhythm that it works in, your body works in twenty one day cycles. It takes twenty one days before you enter into a, a plateau, right? Okay, and plateaus and plateaus are really good for you uh, because you need to stay in a plateau for a certain amount of time in order to get the biggest benefit. You just can't live there in the plateau for the rest of your time. But you need to be in that plateau because that's where all your results are made. Right. Your mind adapts to a training environment way before the muscle does. Sure it does. So people right. usually make the changes because it's based on their mind. Right. Even though their mind is not, the brain is not a muscle, it's an organ. So they're missing the benefit of being in that plateau. All I'm trying to say is I set up a program for these people and I just use whatever components that the trainer's not good at and I develop a program that's based on your physiology. I already know when your physiology is going to hit a, uh, a plateau. So I bring you out of that plateau at certain times throughout your training program. Sure. That's how you start making people really efficient in all those areas, you know? That's it, the reason why I was asking. No, it's, it's something that I, many um, training camps, you know, the, the fighting gyms that, you know, are, are consistently taking fighters out to the UFC, um, they, they honestly don't have a clue. They think they do, but it's they crazy. don't. crazy. And when, if they're encouraging somebody to lose 20 pounds a week before the fight, then they, they have no idea what they're doing. No clue whatsoever. No. I know that when I was competing, and I mean, I know I only got to eat once a day if I was lucky, but the training that I had to do, you know, jumping rope for, for an hour before I went to bed, doing thousands of kicks a day, punches a day, sparring 12 rounds a day, running 10 miles in one hour, otherwise I'd have to do it again doing hell days, which is sprinting 440s and running bleachers with a sparring partner on my back. I mean, it just went on and yeah. on and on and yeah. on. Every time everything started to get easy, this is his way of thinking, as soon as something looked like it was getting easy for me, he'd find a way to make it harder. Right. He'd just find a way to make it harder. Now, me, but nobody else would be able to do that. Yeah. But let me say something to you. I think that what he did there, I'm not condoning anything that he did in the way he treated you. I'm not. No, not, okay. not emotionally, of course. Right. But I want to tell you something that I learned from the Bulgarians, which is what you're telling me right here. What the Bulgarians did with their athletes mm -hmm. is, and I saw this firsthand, otherwise I wouldn't have believed it. Okay? Right. Now, the specific, in their sport, it's about lifting one, uh, the weight one time, as much weight right. as you possibly can, in the clean, clean and jerk, snatch. Yeah. Okay. So what the Bulgarian coaches did, and I was in their training center when they were doing that, they had their athletes do a one rep max 50 to 65 times every freaking day they went into the gym. They train them five times a day. They, they would train them 15 to 20 minutes only doing that because that was being very specific to that, that sport. When those guys went into that, to the event, that was the easy part of their training. Yeah. And that's what he was doing with you. Exactly. And that was actually brilliant because yeah. when you went into that, you were just like, this is compared to what I just came from. Right. I mean, because I was sparring with people who were already professionals and I was just starting or yeah. even when I got to the point where I was a professional they were world champions he always made me work uphill yeah I seldom ever ever got a chance to work at my level or lower you know and the thing about that is is he was lucky that he had somebody who was so strong-minded because it would probably break the average person that's the only way that this doesn't work for maybe most I mean he's probably leaving a segment of this fighting population out of the mix because I mean you're telling me that is, is making me overtrain. I'm not even doing it. You know? I was accused of taking steroids. I never touched them. Yeah. Never. You know, but I was, I was shredded and, yeah. you know, all the time. It's amazing, yeah. you know, to, to hear that. And, it's, it's, uh, and it goes, again, it goes to show you that, that, you know, it's never what, you know, it's never as easy as what it looks on TV. You see these people that are fighting. They, they're, they're beautiful in the way they move. Their body moves, and you just have no clue, you know, the kind <laughs> of true. horrifying suffer fest that you go through to get there. I, you got, know? I got beat on regularly, and not just from him, <laughs> yeah. but from all my sparring partners, because he's always bringing in somebody different. Yeah. Always. I never got comfortable with anybody, except yeah. for one guy who was kind of the guy who was just on you like that. Yeah. That was the one, my main sparring partner, but he just kept bringing in new sparring partners. Never, I never got comfortable. Yeah. So I always had to fight outside of my comfort zone. Spar, train, everything, everything. Unbelievable. And unfortunately, that became, I became used to that. Yeah. So what kind <laughs> I of adapted a, to that? So what kind of effects? Like I can tell you this: the um, 
now that all these years I've been in the sport of bodybuilding, one of the things that I was, that, you know, for me it was about not only the training and just, just overriding all the, the signs, you know, overriding, I don't know if that's me or not, but overriding the signs. But, but one of the things that still sticks to me today are calories in, calories out, calories out. I believe in, although you saw how I ate this the, just a while ago. Yeah. And on the weekends, okay, that's all out the window. Yeah, okay? of course. So Monday through Friday, I have this re uh, regimen, and I can't ever get past that cap because it's too ingrained in my system. I, I, count, I still have scales at my gym. I have scales at home. I still weigh everything Monday through Friday. I weigh everything to the nth degree. When I'm training, I won't get off the bike five minutes earlier or two minutes or 30 seconds before I'm supposed to because I'm trained that way. Right. It doesn't matter. Everything else doesn't matter. People say, how do you do this? How can you endure this, uh, you know, sustain this uh, for as many years as you've done it now, for 20 years or whatever that I've done that? I said, I'm trained that way. I'm trained like, a, like an animal that way, and I never came in. Never. Right. You know? And, and yet on the weekends, it's like, there's nothing I won't eat. <laughs> <laughs> but you know? it's okay. It's like, how do you do that? It's like, it, it flips that switch. Right now on the weekend, unless I train myself, there's no way I can count a calorie. Yeah. That, that, there's no freaking way. I, it's really amazing. I'm never yeah. that extreme when it comes to food and diet. I'm just, I'm, I'm, uh, I go by what, as far as food is concerned, you know, everybody loves breads and and stuff like that. And I, for some reason, I just, I, I just eat whatever my body's asking for. Yeah. Well, you're yeah. very intuitive. Very. Yeah. I yeah. know my body really well. Yeah. And that that can only come through, uh, you know, years of training and doing it first hand. When you start listening to your body, it's amazing what it tells you. Yeah. It you really know? is. And and that's, I think the thing that's really hard to do as uh, well, not uh, not just an athlete. I think some of this. Our intuitiveness gets beaten out of us in, in school. That's just my opinion. Or even at home. At when home. You, when, you, you know, when you say, Mommy, what is that? And they go, you don't see that, right? right. Yes. You and see something in the corner that's really yeah. there, but your mom says it's not. Yeah, and the <laughs> thing about this is what I learned through bodybuilding was to, to trust that voice because Good. that's your, your intuition and your intuitive side. And yet so many times we're afraid to trust that. And But once you learn that it's really... It, it, that's really true. It, that is really a voice there telling yeah, you stuff. Yeah, of course there is. Just listen to it yeah. because it will tell you. And like you said, you know, you you're listening to your what your body really needs, and that's a smart thing to do. But it's not easy. No, a lot of people it's mistake the hunger, mistake a thir thirst mechanism for hungry because they're so dehydrated all the time that they think, you know they they're really thirsty, but they think they're hungry, so yeah. they'll go eat food. Isn't and they're not really hungry. They're yeah. thirsty because yeah. they're dehydrated because people don't drink enough water. Yeah. And, of course, they get their water. If they're eating a high-carbohydrate carb, um, diet, there's a lot of uh, water content in carbohydrates. So if they're eating that diet, they're actually getting some water there. Some. But yeah. to their food. <laughs> yeah. You know, some. Really interesting. You know? I find that just so fascinating. Um, and, you know, it's amazing. You, know, you don't really know what you're capable of doing until you're, you're on, on the mat and on yeah. your back. And then you really see what you're you're capable of doing, and that's you know that's what I learned anyway. So, what kind of injuries besides besides the strokes have you have you attained? Well, I had a. Uh, I know yeah. I'm asking you. Oh, that's but, okay. Yeah. No, I had actually a collapsed lung. I was uh, ah. playing football. I got hit, and when the guy tackled me, he lifted me up as a linebacker, and he drove me right into the ground. I mean, and I big thought. Boys. I, oh yeah, and, and I big thought. Boys. You know, all all the years of, of of playing when I got hit like that, I was born and raised tough by my dad. Yeah. I get up. You know, I would never let you know yeah, that you hurt exactly. me. I would not. I go, back, I go back to the, the huddle way. and I go, fuck! <laughs> <laughs> he nailed me. Yep. You know? But on this one here, I laid, my dad, I was saying, he freaked him out. I mean, he said I laid there. He never saw that happen to me because it knocked the wind out of me. Yeah. And I thought I was going to die on the field. I couldn't get my air. I, I'm sure it wasn't as long as I, it was, I felt like In your like mind, it, it felt like forever, forever, I'm sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that was my, my worst injury. And I tell you what happened. That happened at the uh, last play of the half. Mm. And they carried me off. That never happened to me. I, like, had my arms around the trainers, yeah. and they walked me off. And I said, give me some pain pills. This is back when they could give you pain pills. Right. You know? I said, just load me up with some pain pills. I'm going back out. I went back out there and I played the second half and just so happens I brought my team back and we won. What a raw Cinderella story, right? Right. After the game was over, when my adrenaline all shut Whoa. down, well, what <laughs> really right. happened was 
not only did I break three ribs, yeah. I collapsed the lung. Oh, wait, we have internal bleeding now. Yeah, of course you do. And I, didn't go, <laughs> I did not go to the hospital because I wanted to go to practice the next day or yeah. Monday. Well, long story short, uh, they had to rush me to the hospital because I had so much blood that I lost, I was yeah. starting to black out. Yeah, not good. No, not good. Not good you know, at But all. that's how strong, you know, again, that, that points that that's mindset. It's like, yeah. I'm willing to go do this even if I'm going to die. I didn't collapse a lung which for me, but when I broke my ribs right before oh. the fight, you know, I went into the fight and everybody's going, you're going to get hit in the ribs. I'm like, yeah, so? Yeah, so? <laughs> so be it. Yeah. <laughs> Because you, you know, almost don't feel it after a while. I'd have felt nothing. No. I was one of those fighters, I'm sure like you, I just felt nothing during the fight. Nope. When their adrenaline wore off, I just wanted someone to shoot me. Yeah, right? exactly. That's <laughs> Please true. put me out of my misery. Yeah. Yeah, but during, nothing. Yeah. No, fight, no pain at all. Well, you know, here's the thing. If you're going to go and ascend to, the, to, to that height, I've, I've talked and I've been around enough athletes, you know, you just, it's all about trade-offs. You know, yeah, I know when I got into the sport it, that something could happen to me, but, you know, this motivation that I had, it outweighed that, and I didn't care. Yeah. You know, and I'm really, you know, I'm really happy because I know, I'm just really happy that I had this interview with you because I can relate to you on so many levels. Oh, yeah. And I can say this, without a doubt, I'd want to be in a fight with you any day, but I want to be on your side and not oppose you. Because <laughs> I, I don't know, someone's going to die. <laughs> I think it's going to be me. You know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's so funny because when you talk about bouncing and you're thinking, oh, my God, can I actually fight? I worked for two and a half years as the lead bouncer oh. in a bar in Bakersfield. In, hey, that's what, near me. I, no you know, way. Yeah. It, was, it was a place called Rubens, a really nice I know seafood, that is. seafood restaurant, yeah. and had a little bar adjacent to it and a dance floor. And that, at that time, this, the manager was named Dexter, and Dexter was amazing at promoting all kinds of cool events. So he'd have country night, hip hop night, you know, whatever night, lip syncing yeah. contest. So all walks of life yeah. came in, <laughs> all yeah. of them. And after about twelve thirty didn't get along. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> With you know, however many beers did not get along I think, at all. <laughs> I thought when I worked at night clubs, I thought after I'd been there for a while, Yeah. because when I first started, honestly, okay, I, I don't remember fighting too much because I went into this other zone, okay, yeah. and I was actually quite good. I, I don't know how, but I was. But you know something? The more, the longer I was there, the less I fought because I started figuring out people, yeah, you know, and human nature. When they walk in, you can tell right and, away. Yes. <laughs> that guy after about 1230 is going to be well, an that, asshole. <laughs> I also knew that if I went up to a table, because the, the waitress, they would come up, hey, that guy's pinching my ass. You know, yeah. you, know you know what I'm talking about. Of course. About. Okay. Okay. Let me go <laughs> of check. Of I do. Yeah. Let me go check. And well, I, the, I could count on, I, I didn't know this when I was a young bouncer. If I went up to the guy when he's in this, around these girls, I'd say, hey, I need, uh, you know, this girl's are complaining. And I was trying to be a nice about it and get, knock of it off. It, it's going to be a fight because I was showing him up in front of these girls. Of course. He had to save face. So there was a fight every <laughs> single time. Yep. So what I learned, and I hardly ever fought after that, I said, hey, uh, we have a, a phone call for you. I'd make something up. But I can't hear in here. Why don't you come outside with me? And I'll tell you, I'll give you the message Smart. out there. Smart. Get him away from the herd. Smart. Okay, and I say, you're done. Don't embarrass him in front of people. There you right. go. Yeah. I hardly ever fought after that. You Isn't know? that nice? Yeah, it really is. I wasn't so lucky. No. But I just <laughs> thought you could write a thesis, uh, you know, being a bouncer, because you start figuring out and getting into the psychology of how to make that person productive, even if they're hammered. Because when they're drunk, they're stupid. Very, and, dr and strong. <laughs> it's strong. <laughs> that is a true story. Yeah, they're gorilla strong. Yeah. Anyway, I, I really uh, appreciate you uh, doing this interview with me. And, you know, I wish I could have seen you fight. I really do. And if you ever, ever happen to... Jump on YouTube. It's all over. Well, I, I'd all over I, I'll, I'll check that out. But I, I wish I could have seen you fight in person. I think that would have been really special. Anyway, that would have been fun. Thank you very much for coming on to the much. show. I really pleasure. appreciate that. Thanks. If you want more information about this, click on that link below and go to my website. Also, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below.